All right. Hi, everyone. Before we get started, I just want to let you know that this program is being recorded and will be available on the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum YouTube channel after the presentation. My name is Caroline McCarthy, and I am the Digital Content and Programs Manager at the museum. I want to welcome you to our uh, to the Tegman Farmhouse Museum's new virtual series, History and Focus. History and Focus explores relevant historic topics in Upper Manhattan and the surrounding areas. The theme for our first season is Immigrant Histories in Upper Manhattan. If you have questions during the lec lecture, please use the Q&A function and we will get to those questions at the end. This morning, we're joined by Dr. Deborah Hamer, Director of the New Netherland Institute. Dr. Hamer is presenting the Dutch in Upper Manhattan in the 17th century. The most populous Dutch settlements in the 17th century were in New Amsterdam or Lower Manhattan and in Albany, and most Dutch records produced in the period were produced in one of those two cities. This lunchtime lecture focuses on the documentary record of Upper Manhattan, looking at what records survive and what they tell us about diversity and intercultural interactions in this less well-studied area. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Deborah Hamer. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, if you'll just give me one second, I'm going to share my screen for a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I just want to make it full screen. Okay. Um, someone tell me in the chat if they cannot see this, but I think you should be good. Okay, uh, so uh, the title of my uh, lecture today is The Dutch in Upper Manhattan, uh, and um, I'm so thrilled that Carolyn invited me and that the Dykeman House invited me because this gave me a chance to really sharpen uh, some ideas that I've had for a while. Um, um, and I think this lecture series is really an amazing opportunity. So thank you for, for having me. I'm just going to jump right into it. Uh, what I want to do first is kind of set up a, a problem with studying the Dutch in Upper Manhattan. Uh, and by Upper Manhattan, I mean kind of above 125th Street uh, in modern, uh, modern times, although obviously they wouldn't have called it that. So uh, this is a map. Uh, produced of the whole area of New Netherland, uh, New England, uh, and a little bit you'll see of the Chesapeake Bay towards the bottom of the map, the bottom. Um, and so this is from 1656. And I'm going to move this so that you can see the titles. Um, so this is a, a map that's meant to uh, kind of show the Dutch claims uh, as they stand. So it's meant to be vast. Um, so it shows, you know, kind of all the way up to, to French uh, Canada. Um, but it doesn't, and I'm going to show you, a, let's see, this is a zoomed in just on a small section that goes on the top of the map is Rensselaerswijk or the modern day Albany. And on the bottom, you see Long Island. And then in red or pink, you see the small island of Manhattan. Um, if you look, you can see that there are indigenous names on uh, both sides of the uh, of the Hudson River, uh, but they're none of them refer to uh, or kind of are attached to the specific island of Manhattan. Um, so this is already 1656. The Dutch had uh, arrived, obviously, in 1609 with Henry Hudson and sent the first colonists over in 1623, 1624. So we're already in 1656 when this map uh, was created. That's um, uh, that's much later when the Dutch presence is a lot more secure. So we don't exactly see any uh, indigenous people on specifically the island of Manhattan, which is what we're uh, talking about today, even though we obviously see them all over Long Island and on both sides of the Hudson in um, New Jersey. Uh, and, and New York. So the point of these kind of maps was to suggest Dutch possession of this area to show that their claim was good. 
already um, in the 1620s, there was questions from the English side about whether the Dutch had the right to live in New Netherland, to colonize New Netherland, to claim New Netherland. Um, and again, that's, uh, we'll get into this in a minute, but that's obviously aside from the claims of the original inhabitants, the Native American people of this area. Um, so these are maps that are meant to show that the Dutch know exactly what's in their territory, that they've claimed it sufficiently um, to combat other European claims to the area. I'm going to show you another image. This is a view of New Amsterdam from 1664, and it shows uh, the city of New Amsterdam um, from the water. And again, the point here is that we're seeing we have on the one hand, this kind of very large view of New Netherland that I showed you in the previous images. And we have here a very small view of just this waterfront of the city of New Amsterdam. So this is kind of the two registers in which the Dutch are operating, vast and very small. Um, and to get it even somewhat smaller, this is the Castello plan made in 1660. And it's actually currently uh, on view right now at the New York Historical Society. So you can see it uh, in the flesh. It's here from Italy. So I recommend that you see it if you have the chance. Um, this is a map that shows uh, New Amsterdam below Wall Street. And uh, if you look at it, you can see basically kind of every house at lot. And there's gardens and uh, the the fort is at the tip of Manhattan. So again, this is the register in which uh, the Dutch are thinking about, uh, or at least representing New Netherland uh, in uh, around 1660. So either vast, vast, the entire colony plus all of its neighbors, or very, very small, uh, down to the level of uh, individual houses and individual um, uh, garden plots. And if you uh, look at a book by a person named I.N. Stokes, he's actually labeled each lot uh, based on the name of the person that's attached to it in land deeds. So again, this is an incredible level of detail that we have here, but it stops at Wall Street. Uh, so that leads us to this question, well, what was going on in Upper Manhattan? How do we know? We have all these beautiful images uh, of New Netherland, and we have these images of uh, the city of New Amsterdam as it was below Wall Street in the uh, 1660s, but we just don't know that much about what's going on above 125th Street uh, in this period. So how can we find out more? Uh, one thing we can do is we can turn to uh, scholars of indigenous uh, history and indigenous peoples to help us kind of fill in the gaps. So this is a map taken from a book by Paul Otto about the Dutch uh, Muncie relationship uh, in the 17th century. So he puts Muncie territory uh, basically a lot into New Jersey, including the island of Manhattan and then parts of Long Island uh, and the New York side. So this is a vast territory that includes much more than um, than just the island of Manhattan that we're meant to talk about today. Uh, and it's called uh, Lenape Hoking. That, that, that's the name for this um, uh, this kind of territory. And it's populated by different branches of uh, Lenape people in the period. But again, uh, the point here is that they could, these people could range through these areas. So it's not, uh, Manhattan isn't necessarily a like coherent category of geographical analysis for Lenape because it's, uh, they have this va much vaster uh, area. This is comes from Eric Sanderson's book, uh, Manhattan, and he did an amazing reconstruction of the topography of, um, of Manhattan uh, in the 17th century, or well, in the period prior to, including the 17th century, but prior to European arrival as well. And one thing that's really interesting about the topography is that the area that's now kind of Harlem is a very important um kind of flat area um, compared to some of the more mountainous hilly, he calls them hilly areas uh, in the rest of the island. And particularly hilly uh, is Washington Heights uh, and Inwood. Um, and again, I think we memorialize that in the names that they have now, Washington Heights. It's kind of the, the highest part of uh, Manhattan. So uh, the area around Harlem is kind of, um, uh, 
flats that are kind of in the middle of the hill. So um, obviously these are kind of important um, uh, areas where we would expect to find indigenous habitation and obviously that we would expect to find to be attractive to Dutch settlers who arrive because this is where they can um, plant and uh, have the kind of farms that they, they want to have. Uh, this, I'm not sure how well you can see this, but this is meant to show, this is again from Eric Sanderson uh, from his book, Manhattan. And this shows Lenape trails across the island of Manhattan. Uh, and the clusters of little dots are meant to show uh, habitations. So you can see that there's basically a, a path that goes all the way from, let's say, where New Amsterdam, Lower Manhattan is, all the way up uh, to uh, present day Inwood. Um, and then there's uh, kind of more permanent habitations, uh, a couple at the top in Inwood, uh, and then some more uh, over here, um, which is a little bit below where, where Harlem is. Um, but you can see that the, the uh, paths uh, go cut right through, um, you know, the whole island of Manhattan, including uh, where upper Manhattan to get up to, to Inwood. So these are areas that are very, what well, the point I want to make is these are areas that are very certainly well-known, inhabited, traveled by Indigenous people before the Dutch arrived. Uh, and there were certainly Indigenous people living um, in these areas long before uh, the Dutch knew about them. Uh, to just talk a little bit about about these people. So the we sometimes call them Munsi or Lenape, depending on uh, preference. So as that earlier map showed you, they claimed from Western Long Island, both sides of the Hudson up to Kingston uh, on the New York side of the Hudson River. They were often organized in villages or groups of villages and then into larger groups. Um, it's very, very notoriously difficult to uh, count the number of indigenous people that were there kind of at the time of contact with the Dutch. But just to offer some estimates, perhaps 12,000 in that entire larger uh, Linahapoking uh, area. So the large area, and then perhaps 300 to 1,200 uh, on Manhattan Island itself. And these uh, people did agriculture, seasonal fishing, hunting and gathering. And again, the hunting would mostly have been done uh, by men, as would tobacco planting have been done by men and uh, seasonal fishing. Uh, agriculture would have been done by Lenape women, uh, as would gathering. So uh, women in this culture had a pretty uh, important role. Um, and we shouldn't forget that this was a comfort when the Dutch arrived, this was kind of a clash a little bit of cultures in terms of women doing the planting uh, in Lenape society, and obviously men mostly doing the planting and agriculture in uh, Dutch society. Uh, and the Dutch kind of thinking uh, very negatively or using that as kind of a, a way to delegitimize indigenous presence by saying that they're kind of, they don't follow the right rules by allowing women to be in charge of the planting. Often they would summer in larger groups and then winter in smaller ones and break off. You know, obviously the supplies and sources from the land are uh, more minimal in the winter. So it makes sense to to break off into smaller groups in the winter and then rejoin in the summer uh, when there's more resources to survive on. Um, and what the Lenape were doing is initially when the Dutch arrived, they were selling them first. There was a very good supply of beaver pelts and otters and things like that that the Dutch wanted. Uh, on the island of Manhattan itself initially, but this was quickly over hunted. Uh, and so the kind of traditional way we think about the fur trade is that it's something that's happening in Albany. So that is the case. But in the 16, you know, when the first traders arrived in the 16 teens, the Dutch traders in the early period, uh, the Lenape people are able to trade uh, furs with them because um, there are a lot of streams that flow um, in, Manhattan, where beavers frequented. Um, so that's the kind of initial contact between the two is, is uh, selling furs. And then later on, it becomes uh, selling food when the, the beaver supply is uh, hunted out. Um, the, the, they sell food. And then ultimately what happens is that the Lenape people start on Manhattan start to sell their land to the Dutch. And initially, this may not have seemed like a big deal. There weren't that many uh, Dutch people, but uh, 
as you can imagine, the Dutch population starts growing, particularly in the 1650s. So this starts to become um, more problematic uh, for the for the Lenape. There was probably a long period of time where even if they had sold the land, they were still using it uh, themselves because there weren't necessarily too many European people around. And in any case, it's also obviously not clear that they understood or or had the same uh, understanding of what land sales meant. Uh, in some ways, they may have been thinking about it more in terms of alliance with the Dutch rather than um, the Dutch coming in and kind of kicking them out as a uh, sale implied to Europeans. And so this is also considered uh, kind of a key difference between the way that the Dutch um, interacted with people on the with indigenous people kind of around Manhattan and the way the Dutch interacted with the Iroquois Confederacy up around Albany. The Iroquois Confederacy remained very powerful uh, throughout the 17th and the 18th centuries, uh, whereas the Lenape people, because they sold their land and the Iroquois did not, and also because the, Iro the Iroquois still had uh, furs far, much farther into the 17th and 18th century, uh, the relations were often much better than uh, Dutch relations with indigenous people closer to Manhattan. This map is uh, one that shows, it at least tries to show, it's, again, these things are very hard, but this is also from Paul Otto's book, and, it, and it's meant to show which different groups of Lenape people were inhabiting um, uh, the area around Manhattan. So he places the Rekawanix, sorry that I can't say that word very well, uh, squarely on um, Manhattan Island. Others place uh, perhaps three groups um, there. Uh, Sanderson identifies three different groups that were that were on Manhattan Island. So uh, it's difficult to say, but certainly the this group was one of the main inhabitants of Manhattan specifically. Uh, this is a map that shows uh, Muncie land sales to colonists between 1644 and 1645 and 1664, so before the English takeover. Uh, the areas in the darkest gray are um, meant to show uh, what had been sold. So you see that by 1664, a great deal of Manhattan had already uh, been sold by Lenape people to the Dutch. And again, what that meant from the Lenape perspective is very much uh, not clear and probably uh, was not understood the same way as it was for uh, for the Dutch. Uh, but you also see that there's uh, portions of Long Island as well um, and some of New Jersey that have been sold. So, um, you know, this is by no means uh, um, uh, only a story about Manhattan. And this, is, this is somewhat speculative, but this just to show you kind of a face, give you a face to what we're talking about. This may be a Muncie man. Uh, if it is a Muncie man, he probably was actually uh, captured on Long Island uh, rather than in Manhattan, but it still gives you somewhat of a sense uh, of of um, what the peop these people might have looked like. Um, he has a very sad story, which uh, Evan Hayfley has been, uh, the professor Evan Hayfley from Texas A&M has been uh, solely elucidating. So basically he was um, captured during Kieft's war. So that was a conflict between the Dutch and the indigenous people on Manhattan and Long Island uh, and various uh, other places um, in the vicinity of Manhattan. Uh, and he was given to two West India Company soldiers basically as compensation for uh, for their labor. So instead of giving them cash, uh, the governor, William Keefe, decided to give them this man. Uh, and they brought him back to the Netherlands where he was put on display as kind of a way for them to make money um, uh, out of the, the venture. And there's a notarial deed um, that shows that... Um, he the that like the, where the two soldiers are kind of uh laying out their claim to, to ownership of him basically um so this is very sad and um we don't really exactly know what happened to him or to the two soldiers uh in the end but we do know that he he was claimed by them as their uh property uh as a result of conflicts between the Lenape and the Dutch in Manhattan and surrounding areas
Um, so what I try to do here in this first part is just show you that that upper Manhattan and Manhattan in general was really indigenous ground um, in the 17th century and obviously preceding the 17th century. Um, and that the Dutch were coming to an area that was already uh, very lively with, um, with people and with agriculture and with hunting and uh, uh, with resources, uh, et cetera. And this is, I don't know if any of you have um, have seen this rock, it's in Inwood, it's about a 10 to 15 minute walk from where the Dykeman house uh, stands. Uh, it's a boulder, I'm gonna just move this so that I can read it to you. Um, this boulder marks the spot where a tulip tree grew to a height of 165 feet and a girth of 20 feet. It was until its death in 1933 at the age of 280 years, the last living link with the Rekakawanging Indians who lived here. Um, so this is meant to commemorate, um, this rock is meant to commemorate the kind of passing of indigenous people from the island of Manhattan and from upper Manhattan. Uh, in particular. And we know that in Inwood was, uh, as I think I showed you in that other map, a, a specific site of habitation uh, for indigenous people. They liked that it was mountainous and thus somewhat protected um, while giving them access to the rest of the island. Uh, so this isn't to say, this is kind of a standard European uh, or American way of commemorating these things. Uh, it's something that historians have called firsting and lasting. That is, you identify when they identify when indigenous people uh, were first encountered, and then they identify what they say is kind of the the last um, encounter with indigenous people, as if indigenous people uh, are not there anymore. And uh, so I'm showing you this because I want to say that indigenous people are in fact still uh, connected to the island of of Manhattan. And just because of everything I've said doesn't mean that they they have gone away. Uh, the Dutch would have preferred perhaps that they went away. And certainly when this uh, marker was put up in the 50s, it was part of this moment of seeing indigenous people as people who were now gone. Just as a little aside, the rock does seem to suggest that this is where Peter Minuit purchased the island of Manhattan. So if that is true, that means the purchase of Manhattan, which is obviously this kind of really important moment, occurred up in Inwood, not in lower Manhattan. I am not sure that this is true or not, but it's something that certainly it seems in the 50s, uh, this kind of group uh, in Inwood wanted to claim uh, for themselves as an important uh, moment uh, in time. This is the tree, the tulip tree that initially initially stood in that spot uh, that uh, in Inwood that the rock is meant to commemorate. So it died in uh, 1938. So you can see it kind of sadly surrounded by this fence to, to protect it, but eventually it did uh, fall down and then they replaced it uh, with, with that rock as a commemoration. And again, this shows the route that you could walk from Dykeman House uh, right over there, again, between 10 and 15 minute walk. So we're very much talking about things that are uh, in the community around, uh, around Dykeman House. Um, this isn't, you know, abstract, I would say. And just to bring that point home that, you know, the Lenape obviously are not gone around Manhattan. This is, um, this is a reimagined seal made by Beatrice Glow and Brent Stonefish for Beatrice Glow's exhibit at the New York Historical Society when our rivers meet. And this is also still on view. Uh, so it was made just uh, last year, 2023. And it's a reimagination of what, um, the seal would look like from a Lenape uh, perspective. So you see basically um, a European woman and an indigenous woman kind of together sitting under uh, this tree in more uh, harmony. And their uh, seal is sitting on a turtle because that's the myth of uh, the start of uh, humanity according to uh, the Lenape people that it started on a turtle's back. So again, uh, and Brent Stofish is uh, Lenape himself. So just to bring home the point that these people are very much still here and still thinking about uh, Manhattan, uh, even if in the 50s that rock tried to uh, memorialize them away. Okay, so now that we've talked about the indigenous uh, presence and how vibrant it was, 
in the in the 17th century and before i want to go a little bit into then the dutch arrival and what the dutch were doing in in upper manhattan so this is just a brief timeline to give you some uh purchase in the period so henry hudson arrived in 1609 and he explored the hudson river up to to albany he did have interactions that are recorded uh, in a journal of his uh one of his first mates um, with indigenous people as he went up the Hudson River. It's hard to tell exactly which people uh, he's interacting with, but some of them interactions were positive and some of them were, uh, you know, quite negative. Uh, and some of his men were killed. Um, and his men did kill some um, indigenous people. So this is not, even at the start in 1609, there's already kind of a, um, you know, uh, I don't, it, you know, it's uh, it, it's both struggle and it's trading. It's both peaceful and and bloody, J even from the just literally the first initial moment of of contact. Uh, 1613 um, is the first time uh, uh, the Dutch leave a person behind. So they leave behind Juan Rodriguez. He's a Dominican uh, person. Uh, he was brought up from Hispaniola. And he's the first one who kind of stays without a ship around him and lives on land and trades. Uh, for a year and kind of learns uh, Lenape language. Uh, the West India Company was founded in 1621, and this is um, an image meant to commemorate the West India Company. The first settlers arrived in 1623-1624. So the West India Company did, uh, it was founded in 1621, but there wasn't enough capital in 1621 to actually do anything. So it wasn't until 1623-1624 that the company was able to kind of uh, muster up enough money to uh, send the first settlers uh, to New Netherland. Uh, and this was, um, uh, this kind of settlement in New Netherland was done in tandem with several other ventures in Atlantic waters, including in Brazil uh, and in West Africa. So New Netherland was by no means the only venture that the Dutch were working on in 1623 to 1624. It was one of several um, varied uh, activities. And the first settlers uh, in, who arrived in 1623, 1624 were Walloons uh, mostly. So they were French Protestants who had been chased out of France because of their religion. Um, and they were looking for a new uh, new place to, to settle. So that's what made them attractive to, well, that's what made New Netherland attractive to them. And that's what the was attractive about them to the West India Company, that they were Protestants who wanted to settle. It wasn't that easy to find people who wanted to leave Europe uh, and go settle in these um, far-flung places. And again, it's important to note that when the first settlers arrived, they were initially distributed across four locations. There were about 20 families, so a couple families in each location. One was Lower Manhattan, one was up in Albany, one was kind of in Connecticut, and one was on the Delaware River uh, in present-day Delaware. So again, these are the areas that the the kind of the Dutch are kind of uh, creating, um, sketching a boundary line but, uh, around their claim. So at the moment, Upper Manhattan is not even part of their um, part of their thinking at that moment. Uh, it's to just create this larger boundary area that's going to encompass this whole territory. Uh, Peter Stuyvesant uh, arrives in 1647. Obviously, he's uh, well known to you. And a lot, of, and as I'll say, a lot of the settlement that happens in Upper Manhattan happens specifically in his tenure. So uh, if we think of the first settlers arriving in 1623, 1624, the area around Harlem isn't, um, uh, or between Harlem and Inwood isn't particularly settled until 20 years later uh, when Stuyvesant arrives. Uh, the first municipal government is in 1653. And then obviously the English takeover in uh, 1664 and a Dutch rule, although the Dutch language uh, and Dutch law and Dutch customs persist uh, for an extremely long time, especially in certain uh, pockets way beyond 1664 uh, into the American Revolution in some places. Okay, so what can we say about the town? Or of Harlem. Uh, first of all, it's called New, they call it New Harlem after the city of Harlem in the Netherlands. Um, and we first hear about the town itself, the idea of building a town in 1658. Uh, Stuyvesant uh, makes plans for this uh, new town. He says that uh, when they get 20 to 25 families, he will um, 
send, he'll try to get a minister for the town. Um, he also says that uh, it will be an expansion of the city of Amsterdam, New Amsterdam, uh, he means. Uh, and he says that the reason why he wants to have this town founded is one for the promotion of agriculture. And as we saw, this land area is very uh, good, uh, potentially good agricultural land. So that seems on target why they would want that land. Uh, and he says it's also for security um, and for pasture for uh, for animals. Again, since it's grassy, this seems all very, uh, very reasonable that Stuyvesant would say it. Um, but we know that the land, the when, even when he's saying this uh, in 1658, that he wants to establish really a specific town in Harlem, we do know that that land was inhabited by other Dutch settlers uh, beforehand. So the uh, idea, the um, in 1658, when Stuyvesant is talking about making this town, he specifically says that it's going to be on the land of someone named Jochen Peterson, deceased. So um, it's it's not that it hasn't been uh, inhabited by Dutch people uh, all this time. We, it's just not exactly clear uh, what, you know, at the exact moment when individual farmers kind of came out between 16, sometime between 1623 and um, in 1658 and were, were farming there. We also have a, a complaint from 1660 by a woman named Ariante Cornelis, who says that she had land on the site of New Harlem uh, in 1655 and that now Stuyvesant is giving it away. And that's not fair because she and her husband uh, already had uh, you know uh, cleared it and built something there. So it's not fair that Stuyvesant should now distribute it to, to other people to enjoy the fruits of her labor. Uh, and her story points to something that's um, really important, which is that she says that she was she and her children were kidnapped by indigenous people and her husband was killed uh, on that site of um, of the village. So this points to the fact that um, this is very valuable land. It's agriculturally good. Um, it's, you know, it, it's in a good location. This is something that the the indigenous people and the Dutch people are going to fight over. It's not by any means just a peaceful um, secession of land uh, to the Dutch. Um, and very much that indigenous people were still there uh, and they were still kind of, um, uh, we can imagine probably that there were many moments of coexistence between them broken by uh, violence, but that the Dutch were very much dispossessing um, indigenous people in this moment. It's not just the land that's out there. Uh, and again, this this goes to Stuyvesant's point in 1658 when he says that the point of having this, this area is also for defense. He sends uh, in 1659 eight to 10 soldiers um, to the village. So those are West India Company soldiers that Stuyvesant and the company will pay who are meant to protect uh, the settlers from uh, indigenous uh, reprisals and violence. Um, and from 1658, this is very quickly growing. In 1660, uh, the city gets, the town gets a small uh, bench of justice uh, and also what's called a four laser. That's someone uh, between, like kind of uh, a little bit above a layman, but not a minister. So it's someone who reads aloud uh, sermons or biblical passages uh, and leads psalms during church time. So he's someone literate, but not ordained by any means. Um, but that's a sign that the town is growing, that they have, a, they pay a person um, to do that job. Uh, and then again, they have their, their, in 1660, they've reached the threshold of 20 to 25 families. So that means they're getting this, um, they can, uh, do small crimes, they can judge small crimes in their own community. Uh, so from 1668, 1658, when Stuyvesant says that the town can be built, it's clearly growing in over two years. And again, in 1660, uh, Stuyvesant refers to, uh, to New Harlem as the last town on the island. So it's uh, an important defensive uh, position. So he's, uh, this is during the Esopus Wars. Uh, with indigenous Lenape people around Kingston. So he's very much concerned about um, 
clearly about protecting this area and perhaps about the indigenous people that are still living around um, New Harlem uh, that he doesn't exactly elucidate that they're there, but they probably, we can imagine uh, that they're there. Um, he also promised them in, uh, Stevenson also promised them that uh, the companies enslaved people would extend the road, the, would extend Broadway from New Amsterdam up to uh, up to New Harlem. So that's uh, no small work to be done to go all the way up from Wall Street um, uh, up to to New Harlem. Uh, and again, that's work that he we don't know if uh, the promise was uh, was followed through on, but it's certainly a promise that the that the company slaves specifically are going to do this. Um, and we see again the kind of um, further diversity in 1679 and 16, in 1680 uh, when uh, Jasper Dengartz, he's a, a Labadist missionary, he visits New Netherland and he's trying to find a spot for a colony that's going to be all a Labadist, this religious, religious sect. Um, so he's kind of checking out different parts. He goes throughout New Netherland and uh, into the Chesapeake region as well. Um, and he reports that when he follows um, Broadway, the street out of uh, New Amsterdam to get to New Harlem, um, that he sees many habitations. And again, this is a quotation from him, many habitations of Negroes, mulattoes, and whites. So we get the sense that um, the area between Wall Street and uh, New Harlem is kind of maybe perhaps uh, somewhat area of more, you know, mixed race habitations or uh, former enslaved people living, uh, having freedom, having freedom and plots of land interspersed with Dutch settlers, uh, etc. So this, um, that's what he reports that he sees. And then he reported that he stayed the night in New Harlem uh, with a person named Resolved Waldron, who had served in Brazil. So he certainly, um, he kind of, New Harlem was kind of an important part, or at least a stopping point on his journey between um, uh, New Amsterdam and Albany. Uh, in 1670, again, like to point to the theme of diversity. So in 1670, there are some depositions in the records of New Harlem regarding uh, the fact that the town kept some enslaved people uh, from New Amsterdam during the English attack in 1664. So basically, uh, it, it seems that some slave owners in New Amsterdam didn't exactly know in 1664 when the English arrived, what would happen with the English um, take all their property. And this includes the enslaved people that they claimed as property. So some of them thought, oh, the best thing to do would be to send them away from the city uh, until the takeover is kind of complete and then get them back. So there's some, um, so there's depositions about this kind of as, again, this is not a haven for enslaved people. The enslaved people probably would have preferred to escape and be free, uh, undoubtedly. Uh, but this is a way that uh, Dutch people are using their own connections uh, with this kind of new town in the in upper Manhattan to help themselves. Um, and then um, I also want to say that in we find the town of New Harlem in 1726 in Amsterdam's notarial archives. Um, so a mother is uh, getting claim, unfortunately, to her son's land in New Harlem. She's in Amsterdam, but her son had a, a plot of land uh, in the town of New Harlem um, and he's died and she's um, taking possession of it. Um, so this is to say that even in 1726, the connection with the Netherlands itself was still alive and well um, and that ownership could pass from a uh, person of Dutch descent in the town to um, to someone in Amsterdam. Um, the inhabitants of the town were, uh, again, a number of them were actually, or at least had spent time in French towns and were perhaps French uh, Protestants as the original uh, families that arrived in 1624 were. A number of them had spent time also in, in Germany. So it was somewhat of a, um, a mixed group. The records are kept in Dutch, so it seems that uh, they do know Dutch well enough to keep uh, keep those records in Dutch, but there is a bit of diversity just in terms of European nations um, in this area. And then obviously with 
the indigenous people who are around them and then the enslaved people who are uh, dwelling among them as well. So what I've tried to sketch here is that um, in order to know more about Upper Manhattan in the 17th century, uh, we really need to turn both to documentary sources, but also to, to sources that are not documentary sources. Um, so we can look at land deeds um, from 1630 to 1779 that show these purchases. Uh, not all of them pertain to Upper Manhattan, but among them are purchases that do uh, pertain to Upper Manhattan. Uh, and, uh, and we can see, I think it would be... Um, we could glean a lot of information about who the indigenous sellers were and who the indigenous people who lived on that land was from finding out who was doing uh, the selling there. So I think that's a really uh, important source. We also do have council minutes uh, from the town of New Harlem from 1662 to 1760 um, that were kept in Dutch. Um, and these are in the James Riker collection. Um, and this is a source that unfortunately um, is rather inaccessible at the moment because it's only available on microfilm at the New York Public Library, and it hasn't been translated uh, into it, it translated or digitized. Uh, so that's a project that would be very important for knowing exactly what's going on um, in this area of Upper Manhattan um, past, you know, after 1660 when it becomes incorporated as a town. There's also a collection of Harlem papers at the New York Historical Society, um, which uh, it's not clear what the overlap is between those documents and the ones at the New York Public Library. So again, this goes to the point that um, there's much more that we could do to find out about, um, about even through the documentary record, it's exclusively, there's much more we could do to find out about the Dutch um, in this period and, um, what they're what they're doing, how they're interacting with indigenous people, uh, you know, and just without even, you know, not necessarily doing anything beyond documentary record. Um, and then we also have, as I mentioned, these kind of extra documentary ways of finding out about Upper Manhattan. So particularly uh, Eric Sanderson's book, Manhattan, which reconstructs kind of uh, the geography and the topography and uh, the paths and all, you know, the waterways that we don't see anymore. Um, so that gives us more of an idea of who was there, what they were doing. Um, James Riker uh, wrote a book about Harlem uh, in uh, 1881. So as you may imagine, uh, the book is rather um, celebratory of uh, the Dutch and of the European settlers. Um, and does not pay much attention to uh, the fact that there were likely ens uh, enslaved people uh, um, among the residents of New Harlem uh, and doesn't pay much attention also to the dispossession of indigenous people, but it does give an extremely uh, detailed account of the Europeans who settled there um, in the, the individual settlers who arrived in the 1640s and 1650s and then the people who arrived after the town was incorporated in uh, in 1660. And then uh, of course there's various books about uh, the Muncie, uh, including Paul Otto's book, The Dutch Muncie Encounter in America. Um, so these are books that kind of focus obviously on the uh, very important indigenous side uh, of the story and do the hard work of reconstructing um, their perspective based on um, kind of counter readings of the European sources and looking at the maps uh, that have the names of indigenous people and places on them. Um, so to conclude, what I hope is that I've showed you that New Harlem is this kind of, and Upper Manhattan in the period of the 17th century is really this kind of um, tremendously important area, but this area that's very much under indigenous uh, control still, uh, and that the Dutch are arriving as settlers who are dispossessing um, indigenous folks uh, from the land that they've been using for centuries. Um, but that there's more that we could say if we could look at, if we were more systematic about the records, about these interactions, um, 
And there's more that we could certainly say about the presence of enslaved people uh, in households in New Harlem if we were able to have more access to these records to get them digitized, to get them translated. So there's a rich body of material out there uh, waiting. So what I've said today is kind of only a preliminary uh, investigation that I hope someone will take up to do further investigation uh, on. But it's very clear to me that this area is very uh, diverse um, from the start. Uh, and that it's possible that it's actually um, very much kind of a flashpoint for Dutch indigenous conflict in the 17th century. So trying to, to the Dutch wresting away this kind of very uh, good agricultural land uh, from indigenous inhabitants. So even though kind of maybe all the attention's on lower Manhattan, on New Amsterdam and on Albany, I think there's a really important story to be told here about uh, about Upper Manhattan that we're just scratching the surface of. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hamer. So we have a number of questions already, but I just want to remind our participants um, that you can use the Q&A function if you have any questions. Um, our first question is, uh, this person has heard from contemporary Lenape that historically Lenape considered their farms as belonging to the woman and not the men. Do you know if there's any evidence of this oral history? Yeah, this there, this is, that's true. That's a, um, that uh, the land was considered as uh, belonging to the women. They were the one who, ones who cultivated it. Uh, they also controlled the food often um, and distributed it. So um, yes, that's, uh, that's very clear in the kind of anthropological uh, literature. Great. Thank you. Um, our next question is, uh, this person is asking if the various Native groups had written treaties amongst themselves, and if not, what, if so, what form did they take, um, and what languages were these agreements written in? Um, and I guess if not, uh, maybe you can speak to how that was navigated. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I think this question is kind of the, getting at how the indigenous groups interacted with one another rather than uh, with Europeans. So something that's also happening in the period that I didn't really mention is that um, the Mahican, um, who are all, another group of Algonquin indigenous people, so they're not Haudenosaunee or Iroquois people, but they're kind of um, geographically much closer to uh, the Haudenosaunee, they are actually kind of trying to, the Mexican are trying to do, um, to, they say, and, and I, you know, it's difficult to assess this claim. They say that, that uh, the Lenape had um, historically been tributaries of theirs, that they had been a subordinate group to them. So the Mexicans are also coming in and kind of saying, oh, Lenape people, you owe us a tribute. Meanwhile, Willem Kieft down in New Amsterdam is saying also to these Lenape people, you owe us tribute, you're our subject people. So these are two counter pressures coming from different geographical directions um, on, um, uh, on these folks in Manhattan. Um, and I think that they had, uh, you know, things were, were uh, perhaps it's true that at some point they had had a tributary relationship with the Mexican, but things are fluid. Um, and obviously they didn't think that they did anymore. So, you know, whoever can, um, uh, you know, uh, you have to actually, after the Mexicans say that the Lenape are in a tributary relationship with them, they then have to force them into that tributary relationship again. So uh, I think it's, um, uh, it's not necessarily a matter of agreements or not agreements. It's more a matter of sometimes um, the current power at the moment. So these are these are fluid situations. They're not staying the same over the centuries, even before the Dutch arrive. Awesome. So we're getting more questions as as you're talking. <laughs> so this is great. Um, our next question is, would someone who speaks Dutch today be able to read the old New Harlem text in the Riker collection at NYPL? Or is the Dutch language from that time similar to old English in that it's something that would require a specialist? Um, I would say somewhere in between uh, those two poles. It definitely takes, uh, for a modern Dutch speaker, it would take a while to get used to it the same way that if you're a modern English speaker and you go read 17th century records from New England or Virginia, there are certainly, um, 
um, unfamiliar words and unfamiliar sometimes uh, expressions and things like that, and certainly an unfamiliar handwriting, um, but that you can kind of, if you pra with practice, you can, um, you can do it. So I think it's kind of the same way uh, in early with early modern Dutch that, um, you know, being a specialist helps, but you can get yourself to the point of being a specialist if you know modern Dutch. Great. Yeah, that was actually from a uh, a Dijkman researcher. So maybe we can. <laughs> yeah, we're out. certainly up for uh, for trying to help you guys uh, train uh, people to read early modern Dutch. Uh, we have the resources definitely. to. Awesome. So our next question, um, I'm not familiar with this, but maybe you are. Uh, this person is asking if you have any information about uh, Vervelen Ferry and Ale House. Um, I don't have too much information. There is obviously a ferry up uh, in, in Inwood, um, but I don't know too much about it. Awesome. Let's see what else we have here. So, oh, wait, sorry. I just want to say one more thing about that. Oh, in sure. the Harlem records, if you do look, I believe there is records of, um, I can't remember his name, but someone getting the rights to uh, be the ferryman. Um, so if you do want to know more about that, I think there could be an answer. I just don't happen to know. Um, great. So sorry about the phone ringing in the background. <laughs> um, we have another question from uh, one of our, our researchers here at the farmhouse, um, which is asking, uh, Resolved Waldron was the father of Jan Dykman, or Jan Dykman's second wife, uh, Rebecca Nagel. Um, and this person wants to clarify that you said uh, Resolved Waldron had served in Brazil. Yeah, so um, that's something I didn't mention so much in the talk, but something that's interesting about New Harlem is that there's a resident, certainly one resident, Dutch resident, who had been in Martinique before arriving in New Harlem. And I believe there's two who had been in Brazil, um, one of whom is, I believe, Rizal Wadron. I would have to go back and really look, dig into it. But if the person wants to get in touch with me, I, I, can, I can do that. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of... Um, Brazil fell in 1654 back into, well, sorry, take a step back from that. The Dutch conquered a part of Brazil in 1630, and they kept it until 1654. Um, it started really going downhill in 1645. So there is a group of, of soldiers who served in Brazil um, who end up after 1645 in New Netherland, um, a, a large group. Um, and they kind of uh, come at a moment when... Um, Stuy when Kieft and then Stuyvesant are kind of undermanned. So it's actually quite, um, uh, it's a, it's a good coincidence for them, I guess I would say, um, that, that they arrived. So, and then in 1654, when the colony, uh, kind of ultimately and fully falls, uh, there are, there's a couple more, um, residents of that colony who come to New Netherland, including, uh, most famously, uh, a group of Jews who had been in Brazil arrive in New Amsterdam. Thank you. So we have a couple more questions. Uh, this person is asking if you know if the Dutch Reformed Church uh, was involved in any of the Lenape massacres. I mean, it depends what you mean by involved. Um, if you want to say, you know, like direct, uh, was a minister of the Reformed Church directly in any of the attacks, I would say no. Uh, but did the Reformed Church... Uh, do anything to prevent attacks on indigenous people? Certainly not. Um, and it's um, pretty likely that um, the ministers, there were only there were uh, only two ministers in the, of the Reformed Church around in the 1640s, one in Albany uh, and one in New Amsterdam. Later, there would be a, a few more in 1664. There would be a couple uh, more. There would be also one in, in Brooklyn uh, who happened to have been a veteran of the Brazil affair. Uh, his name is Johannes Polemius. And he, uh, kind of adjacent to this question, very much owned enslaved people in Brazil and was still trying to recoup the losses that he felt he had suffered uh, by not being able to take those enslaved people with him. Um, so the Reformed Church is by no means a force of, uh, of good or uh, toleration or equality, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, Mega Palensis, who is up in, in Albany, uh, does seem to have had some good relations with the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois people who were up there. Um, but uh, in Manhattan, where the these kind of wars with Lenape people are happening, uh, there certainly is no reform voice saying, don't, don't do this. 
even if they're not actively taking up arms. Uh, and if we look at, um, we have kind of more of an idea of how the Dutch ministers felt about indigenous people in Brazil, because there's uh, more church records there. Um, and, you know, again, there it's very much, um, you know, uh, they view the indigenous people of Brazil as people to be converted to Christianity. Uh, so perhaps protected uh, a little bit from uh, from being enslaved, but definitely as not in any way equal to Dutch people. So I guess that's kind of a long-winded way of saying um, we don't have as much information as we'd like, but um, I don't think that the attitude was uh, particularly positive. Um, so this one's more of a comment, uh, but this person just wanted to mention another resource uh, for learning about this history, which is the NYC Department of Records um, and Information Services, um, and that uh, they also have a project called the New Amsterdam History Project. Um, so if you're looking to learn more, that's a, another uh, resource. Um, but that is all the questions that we had. Um, so I just wanted to thank you again, Dr. Hamer, uh, for this fantastic discussion. Um, I hope that all of our participants enjoyed this talk. Um, Please consider making a donation to enable us to continue to offer free public programming at the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum. Gifts in any amount are appreciated. I'd also like to remind, remind our participants that this was the first of three lectures in our History and Focus series. Uh, you can join us here next Wednesday, June 5th at 12 p.m. on Zoom for Juan Rodriguez, The Immigrant Spirit by Dr. Ramona Hernandez. Um, be sure to register through the link in the chat uh, and follow us on social media for more updates. So thank you again and have a great rest of your day.